So I'm going to start recording this uh, for those of you who don't wish to be seen. Um, turn off your video. All right. Would you like me to begin? Yeah, I'm going to start sharing with you, Carl. Okay. So I think you need to, yeah, you need to hit share screen. And there we go. Let me know how that looks. Can you see the crack screen? I can. I'm looking at a uh, Alpine Glow, Alpine Songbird Habitat Associations amidst the changing climate. Okay, good enough. All right, okay. I'm going to mute myself, but I'll be listening. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Bernie and Francis and everyone for showing up today. Uh, I'm Carl Brown. I currently work as a wildlife biologist for Biodiversity Research Institute. Uh, the one out of Portland may not the one out of Laramie. It gets kind of confusing. And I currently work on uh, common loons and human disturbance and harlequin duck uh, in the GYE. Like Bernie mentioned, I've worked for the Game and Fish Department on and off for the last decade, not recently, but mainly on ungulates and disease and swans and uh, I guess some other large mammal projects. But uh, I am here today to talk about alpine songbirds. So um, with that, uh, first of all, I'd like to say this is, while I work for BRI, what I'm talking about today is largely revolves around a master's project um, wrapped up about a year ago at the University of Wyoming in the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. And because it's bird club, and I think that any other time, I really have to say thank you to the Megan Burt Rains Wildlife Fund because it did provide the initial funding to then get enough momentum to get full state funding for a master's project. And I think most folks understand how difficult it is to get non-game projects moving. All right. And before I go any further as well, with the upcoming, fingers crossed, publication, uh, I need to say thank you very much to co-authors, uh, Dr. Anna Shalfoon, who is my advisor at the co-op unit, Dr. Kenneth Drew, who is part of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Wyoming, and then Nick Rosenberger and Gabriel Brill, uh, who are friends and uh, one was a lab mate who have really helped with the heavy lifting on the analyses, who are currently working on their PhD and postdoc and well, one in Germany and one in Colorado. All right, so we'll get into it here. Alpine dependent species are to be most impacted by climate change uh, progressing into the future. And despite disproportionate impacts of climate change on the species that uh, inhabit these upper reaches. Key habitat relationships, basic habitat associations are completely lacking for many of these uh, species, which really leads to the need for identifying these specific habitat associations. And even at the most basic level, uh, the broad range in which uh, these species are found across the landscape. And understanding a little bit better about the distribution and the species or the habitat associations for these species will better allow us to understand not only the risks. In a very rare case or two, you might imagine uh, there might be a way of mitigating. Um, and when we're not allowed to mitigate, I think that there's importance at least in understanding uh, what is occurring. So I think that most folks who are attending are pretty well aware that when we think about alpine ecosystems and maybe I'll revert a little bit to tundra ecosystems, there's a lot of upslope movement in the alpine and poleward movement, uh, especially when we think in the Northern hemisphere. Well, it's of course the Southern as well, but we'll focus on the Northern hemisphere today when we do. One way of thinking about uh, this upslope or poleward movement there's one paper that I think does a really good job in my mind of illustrating kind of the severity of the impact where across the Alps, uh, researchers visited uh, sites in 20, 2001 and 2008. And within just that, you know, if we were to call it an eight year period uh, or less in some of these uh, survey periods, not only were they seeing upslope movement of plants across say boreal and Mediterranean uh, montane uh, ecosystems in the, the more boreal, non-water limited locations that we're seeing crowding on the summits. So a lot of these alpine and montane plant species have long life, uh, long lifespans. 
And when you have upslope movement, they start to compact on the top. And when you look at locations such as the water limited Mediterranean, uh, they weren't seeing the compaction up on top of these summits. They were just seeing the outright loss of high elevation species, most likely because there was nowhere else to retreat up. When we think about the Tetons, uh, I think a lot of folks, it's a pretty steep angled mountain range. I think they think of a tree line uh, landscape such as what you see here, uh, a couple different benches with varying degrees of woody vegetation, uh, whether it's uh, coniferous or willow. But maybe for the rest of the talk, think about places that aren't the Tetons necessarily. And here's a view of the Bighorns uh, near, is it Fortress or Bomber Peak, uh, where you have more of these crumholds and shorter willow communities that or well below your eye level when you're out there and you might otherwise ignore unless you're out there fishing and you catch your fly on uh, some woody vegetation. Close to home in uh, Colorado, I think, uh, well, across a 62 year uh, survey period, it's Niwot Ridge just outside of Denver. Uh, they witnessed a 450% increase in shrub expansion. Uh, that project, I think, or the paper was published in 2008, so you can only imagine how much more expansion has probably taken place over the last decade or greater. Uh, words are great, but in the upper right-hand corner is an image of a, what would that be, 30-year period, uh, where you can see uh, a replication of a photo taken in 1981, and then 2012, where you can see a lot of a filling in of more open habitat by willow communities. And I think it's really worth thinking about other tundra communities other than Alpine when thinking about a lot of the topics today. If you look at the images on the left, uh, these are photos that were taken across roughly 30 year periods uh, that really document the encroachment by woody vegetation, namely shrubs in places such as Alaska and uh, Northern Canada. And when you, when you talk to the folks who have done a lot of say songbird work up there, and often they're looking at the impacts of changing landscapes or habitat associations of these tundra species, they'll say, you know, I came back after five years of being on my project to ban some birds and drink some beers at the field site. And where there used to be shrubs that were knee height, they're now just below my shoulders. And then you talk to folks who were there 15 or 20 years ago, they'll say there were no shrubs. And so things are, of course, changing globally very rapidly. I, this is probably a slide I'll never have to update, no matter how long I give this talk or something similar, that the last decade was the warmest on record. And I think that anybody who's gone over a hurricane in uh, the Tetons will quickly you know, point out that uh, schoolroom glacier uh, is quickly retreating. Uh, what does this mean for snowpack and uh, things of that sorts in the Rocky Mountains? Uh, we expect a threefold increase in the average global temperature change in these sorts of locations, so it's a disproportionate impact. By the end of the century, we're, it's expected, and I think these are really conservative numbers, and they're probably outdated at this point, the 60% reduction in snowpack and a 30 to 40 day advance in snow melt. And this isn't a very old paper, but uh, every single time there's a new one out, uh, things don't look much better. So when we start to think more about vertebrates, and uh, of course, we'll be talking about birds today, we have to mention some of the previous work that really points out kind of large scale upslope movements of montane bird communities. And here's just two different articles where they talk about the loss of uh, avian richness and upslope movement and changes in montane uh, ecosystems. But talking earlier about how we're missing a lot of the key habitat associations, while we have kind of a um, view from high up on a lot of uh, what might be going on, what we're really lacking, especially in North America, are specific species habitat associations and any sort of metric that can be measured directly not just a broad assumption that we know things are moving up, but trying to look at something a li little bit more mechanistic. So 
when we start to think about alpine avian communities in Wyoming, there's really three species that come to mind. And this is bird club, so already some folks are disgruntled by only seeing three species up here. But what really uh, made up the major makes up the majority of bird observations when you're in an alpine environment in the state of Wyoming or surrounding areas are black rosy finches. And that's a really nice looking male on the left. And thank you again to Ronan Donovan for allowing us to use uh, images originally intended for Audubon uh, for continued educational purposes. So you have a, a nice adult male black rosy finch on the left. In the upper right hand corner, you have an American pipit. In the lower right hand corner, you have a white crowned sparrow. Two of those birds have names that are pretty good for identifying them. The pipit um, doesn't say much about its looks, but if you can remember these three species throughout the rest of the talk, um, that, that is good enough to say the least. And of course, we left out species like horned larks or alpine breeding savanna sparrows or tree line brewers or mountain bluebirds. There's a huge list of Clark's nutcrackers. But just from our numbers alone, 72% of all of our observations were these three species, with very few going over 1% to 2% of the rest of the remainder. So I'll introduce some of the, I guess, the characters we'll be talking about. Black Rosie Finch, which is the main emphasis of the funding for my master's work. Black Rosie Finch is one of three Rosie Finches found in North America. Uh, watch uh, these species over the next decade. They may get uh, re-lumped and grouped and split, but for right now we have the brown cap Rosie Finch, which mainly takes up the state of uh, Colorado, or is it? almost exclusively found in the state of Colorado, I should say, and with a little bit of the population bleeding over into the snowies near Laramie. Uh, the gray crown rosy finches go from effectively the Sierras up north through the Cascades, through Canada and into Alaska, and back down through the Rockies until you hit about the Bob and south around Missoula. I think Lolo Pass is technically a hybridization zone. Almost the rest of the Intermountain West is uh, taken up by the black rosy finch, which is what we're talking about today. And that's, the, I'd probably say the lion's share are probably in Wyoming, but populations in Idaho, Montana, Eastern Oregon, and uh, Utah, and uh, Nevada. So the black rosy finch is uh, partners in flight, red watch list. Uh, and for similar reasons, they're a species of greatest conservation need unknown. Uh, in the state of Wyoming. And I think one of the main things is that we have broad assumptions that this is a species that because it's the highest, you know, the rosy finches are the highest breeding group of avian in North America. And there's a lot of different ways you can split these meaningless contests, but you would expect them to be potentially some of the most vulnerable. So one way I like to describe about the breeding range when it comes to rosy finches is to talk about the pika, the little alpine rock rabbit. I think everyone here is very familiar with. And the Tetons, you'll find them, I can think of, I think Wolf Creek down in the uh, Snake River Canyon. You can find them almost down in the valley floor, if not all the way up to some of the highest reaches uh, when you go climbing. And we tend to think about them as being a real you know, alpine-ish obligate. When you think about the black rosy finch, however, we really don't begin to see them until you hit about 10 to 11,000 feet in northwestern Wyoming. And this is, of course, only their, their breeding range. During the winter, they come down to the people's bird feeders and uh, some of the high desert environments and uh, ski resort towns. But until you hit about 10 to 11,000 feet, you really don't see them breeding at all. So to put it in contrast with some of these other um, alpine uh, breeding species. What they're probably really well known for is that, aside from bre breeding in the alpine, is that they place their nests in the cliff faces, which is pretty cool, of course. And I think this picture illustrates a lot about what um, is rosy finch habitat. Uh, we often asso associate them with glaciers or late persistent snowpack, tundra. Um, but Part of the project was to test some of these assumptions as well. In uh, Wyoming, they are only found in the northwestern corner of the state. And when we talk about basic information, 
we hadn't tidied up the distribution in the state uh, until uh, at least in people's field books until probably about uh, 2015. And uh, I have to say again, the Rains Fund made this project specifically looking at their distribution in the state of Wyoming possible. So not a whole lot known on them, even though every species where they say there's not much known, there's a stack of literature, you know, a foot tall, but it's, a, it's relatively speaking. And a lot of it is older literature. The American pipit is the second species we'll talk about. It's a ground nesting alpine owl. Yet it's probably the most studied alpine species in North America. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, unlike the rosy finch that has a nest and it holds no territory and it'll fly several kilometers away from its nest to forage. The pipit has a defined territory. And when you walk through, they shoot up like a bouncing Betty or, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll shoot up in there and display that you are in their territory until you leave. And so there's quite a bit known about them as well, or there's a lot known about them. The last species is the white crown sparrow, probably the most highly studied species in North America, if not the world by some folks standard. Uh, they are not an alpine obligate. You'll find them everywhere from a McDonald's parking lot next to the ocean or a Walmart parking lot in any major city all the way to any place in which you have uh, woody vegetation. Um, I wanna make sure folks don't think of them as, you know, the evil species in any of this because we'll talk about potential encroachment and turnovers in bird communities, um, but they are a woody vegetation obligate and uh, pretty cool life history that they can exist basically anywhere on the continent where there's a shrub. Okay, so, to talk about a little bit of an overview of what we are discussing today, um, we're looking at basic habitat associations of alpine songbirds in Wyoming. And the way in which we're assessing this is looking at not only rosy finches, which was the original main task, but we really decided we wanted to look at it at a, more of an avian community level because there's a lot more to learn if you can compare and contrast the different species that are up there and start to think about climate change vulnerability. We use multiple scales to assess climate change vulnerability in the sense that we'll be talking about what seems to drive abundance at the site level and what individuals are using. And so that might, you know, if we were to think about a different species, we might say, I'll pick moose. Um, you know, does, do we find higher numbers of moose at a certain part of the year with increasing levels of riparian area? Maybe, maybe not. And then within a site level, are say moose using riparian areas or are they using something like bitter brush? So we wanted to look at what drives abundance and also what individuals are doing. And for some of these habitat covariates, we're using something called time for space, which basically means that we had only probably a couple dozen rosy finch breeding records in the state of Wyoming prior to this project. Now we have several thousand uh, and the, the, the hard part with that means that we can't go back in time and say, look at certain sites and see how anything's changed since say the 1980s or beyond. Um, we're kind of stuck with years 2016 and 17 when we did our field work. And uh, if we do things like look down slope where we might think the future of vegetation is, can we make an inference about what the future might be when that vegetation moves up in elevation? Before I go any further, we adapted a huge amount of our field techniques from John Stanick's master's thesis, who also went to the University of Wyoming, uh, who was in Craig Bankman's lab and looked at brown cap rosy finches in Colorado. So, uh, field work, what did we do to get to where we are? Uh, in 2016 and 2017, oh, we visited, uh, a total of seven different mountain ranges, uh, two of them, the Beartooths and the Tetons, we repeated in both 16 and 17, while the rest were only visited during one of those uh, seasons. So we went to the Bighorns, the Southern Winds, the Grovant, the Wyoming Range and the Salts, which we kind of looked at together as the Grays, the Tetons and the Beartooths. We would arrive on sites and walk transects that I think were about 1.6 kilometers on average. And here's a, this transect actually is a bogus one, but it, it represents generally what we did. Uh, we would walk a transect 
uh, while recording avian observations and recording habitat data. And I put a red buffer around there that is about 70 meters on either side of the observer. And that's where we probably saw the overwhelming majority of our bird observations. So something to think about when you think about what we actually measured. We visited each site three different times in the field season. Typically, we try to get there in June. Uh, one year, we had, say, 200% snowpack. So we couldn't get there till July for our first transect, but we would try to visit in June, July, and August to try and capture um, different stages of life history. And as you can see, a lot changes uh, throughout the summer in the alpine snowpack being the most obvious. Uh, here's a mock-up of transects at our in the Tetons, which were lower elevation sites. So I think this is, I think I took this photo from the middle Teton, but you can see right below in uh, places such as Steamboat, <clears throat> excuse me, Mount Meek and uh, Schoolroom, not Schoolroom, but no, I haven't been up there for a little bit. But uh, this is kind of generally how a lot of the transects were laid across the, um, the, the ranges. So we ended up going to 100, we conducted a 171 unique transects at 46 unique sites across seven ranges with two to three observers per year in 16 and 17. And again, when we were walking these transects, we were writing down bird observations while simultaneously recording habitat data. Okay, I haven't done this before in a talk, so I'm gonna try a little bit to describe about how we are actually gathering data because very little of the habitat data is actually gathered in the field. So here's a map of lost twin lakes in the Bighorns. It, hopefully you can see it's a, a topographic map. So we punch our GPS the whole time we go through there. And when we come back, we can reproject. Here's a group of three different transects laid over each other. In theory, they should be right on top of one another. And while we were walking our transects, we would write down bird observations. And we would do that by using a range finder to get distance. It'll be use a compass to get uh, a bearing and then a clinometer inclinometer to get inclination, you know, whether or not they were up on top of something or down low. So we didn't reproject things incorrectly on a map. What this allowed us to do was uh, do just that, come back and place birds on more specific locations for analyses using, say, GIS, broadly speaking. If I were to reproject this onto Google Earth, which is a lot easier to look, look at, you have our transect and white crown sparrows are green, American pipits are yellow and black rosy finches are red. So uh, that's, that's basically where we begin when it comes to extracting information for analyses. So that'll give us information when it comes to what our individual is using and then you can throw pseudo absence points on there and compare what is a real bird using versus what is a false location uh, because we didn't have any true absence sites. But we also wanna ask what is driving abundance at site level? So to do that, we would put a buffer around our transects and then uh, lay this over a different uh, raster layer or a different, basically a map in GIS. And the one I've selected here is something called heat load index. And all it is is areas that receive a lot of sunlight. Uh, the non-shady areas are represented by red colors. And areas that are usually north facing cliffs, for example, that receive less solar radiation are um, illustrated with blue and tan is in between. So we can then take the site level numbers, average them out. The site would probably come up as a warmer site or a site that receives higher amounts of solar radiation. So what habitat covariates were we actually interested in to look at climate change vulnerability? The one that we gathered in the field was looking at uh, landscape level uh, <clears throat> percentages when it comes to tundra, snow, and boulder. As you'd imagine, each time you show up, these change because snow is retreating. So when you're walking your transect and you're punching your GPS every time you step out of a snow field or on a boulder or back in the tundra, you can come back and recreate something similar to this and then calculate out what was at the landscape. Maybe 52% of this one was snow. And then you can compare that uh, to what the birds were doing. 
GIS derived habitat, here's that buffer again, but this time on Google Earth, where it's easier to conceptualize, I think, and then those transect lines in black in the middle. We wanted to look at distance from cliffs. We know that black rosy finches nest on cliff faces, so we wanted to see if distance too was driving abundance or if individuals were using closer the locations in closer proximity. So once again, in GIS, we could map out where the cliffs were and begin to calculate out um, that sort of information. I won't go into it much further. Heat load index, which I just went over, which is a proxy for us for looking at things like temperature because there are, there's not a lot of good data that we could actually use. So again, the areas that are on south facing cliffs, for example, receive higher amounts of solar radiation and north facing cliffs uh, are generally cooler. We also looked at woody vegetation cover. And this is where I would get into uh, what I mean by time for space. So each on this figure, each one of those symbols represents a unique transect. Say if I went to Alaska Basin in the Tetons, that is one particular site that I would then repeat six different times total across two years. But that site gets a unique value in this figure. And all we're looking at is what percent of that location was covered in woody vegetation. And then if we were to contrast that with the elevation of that site, as we'd expect, the higher up in elevation you go, the fewer trees you find. Um, it's, it's nothing very surprising, but we at least wanted to prove it to ourselves that the data happened to be correct. And by looking at this figure too, you can also think about, well, if plants were to advance 100, 200, 300 meters upslope in elevation, uh, what might that impact be? Or if we can start to look at how quickly plants are advancing upslope, we might begin to think about the impacts of climate change. For those who are really paying attention, they have listened, talks about rosy finches or know about them. They do cluster up in nursery flocks during the late season. So we did remove these from our analyses. And this is another, Ronan took this photo. Uh, this is a uh, uh, hatch year rosy finch. All right, so what did we predict? With, with regards to woody vegetation, uh, we would expect that our uh, alpine obligates in the black rosy finch and the American pipit to have a negative association with regards to abundance uh, with woody vegetation. The more encroach a site gets with willow, fewer black rosy finches we expect to see, for example. And the opposite would be true for white crown sparrows as they tend to nest in and around uh, shrubs. With regards to individuals, we use a metric called probability of use. Um, and we'd expect that a black rosy finch would be less likely. And in this case, we're not looking at use or not use. We, we decided for individuals to look at whether or not they were associated with uh, proximity to woody vegetation. Would an individual be found <clears throat> more often, for example, the further away you might get from woody veg. And for black rosy finch and pipits, we would expect a negative association and with white crown sparrows, um, as we rarely ever see them anywhere except for near woody veg, we'd expect them to be very close. With regards to heat load index, which is the best we could figure out when it came to kind of a temperature proxy, we would expect sites with uh, lower heat load index uh, uh, with increasing levels of heat, I should say, we would expect, say, fewer black rosy finches. We expected not a large difference with American pipits and a positive association with white crown sparrows because a lot of the habitat that they use uh, often is correlated with uh, a longer growing season. And we expected similar between site level abundance and individual use in this case. When it came to distance from cliffs, uh, previous work had suggested that brown cap rosy finches are found in greater abundance and uh, you'd have a higher probability of detecting one the closer you are to a cliff. Uh, we didn't expect uh, selection in either direction for pipits and white crown sparrows. And some of this, again, has to do with the fact that they hold territories. And uh, they do not depend on cliffs for that part of uh, the nesting portion of their life history as ground nesters. When it came to tundra, we expected almost every single time we'd see a black rosy finch, they're foraging on tundra. And we made an assumption that 
rosy finches would be more positively associated with increasing levels of tundra. This is, did not end up being true. And I think we realized our error by thinking about what individuals use versus what drives abundance. Uh, but we expected a positive association. Same with white crown sparrows and no selection with pipits. I won't get into uh, individual use results for this because I think that there's the temporal component that um, is not going into this publication. So results, importance of cliffs. I'm sure nobody's shocked that there's a negative association at the site level with regards to black rosy finches and distance from cliffs. So the further away you are from a cliff, the fewer black rosy finches you'd expect to see say doing a theoretical transect. Uh, however, the further away from a cliff uh, you would go, we would also see a positive association with American pipits. When it came to individual use, black rosy finches are highly associated with foraging next to cliffs, which is one of the biggest points that we make with folks who say, I would like to go look for them or survey, is get as close to a cliff as you can. If you think a rock might fall on you, you're getting into the right place, um, not to sound awkward about it, but it is very true that you really should be within about 100 meters of a cliff if you expect to have pretty good detections of finches. Uh, when it came to uh, individual selection by either pipits or white crown sparrows, we didn't find anything uh, very significant, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, evidence that, or suggestion that pipits might use sites more frequently further away from cliffs. Uh, when it comes to tundra, uh, we found a negative association with uh, black rosy finches. And I think what this really got at was while black rosy finches might forage on vegetation and anything that we wrote down when we were in the field was either vegetation, boulder, or snow, we never looked at specific species they were foraging on. And the species that they prefer, you know, probably preferably forage on, are probably found in areas of more alpine environments, which are sparser. Uh, inherently. And so it's not surprising that areas that have increasing levels of boulder uh, have also higher levels of black rosy finches. With regard to tundra, we definitely saw a positive association with white crown sparrows and no selection with pipits. And once again, a lot of this no selection with pipits might also have to do with being ground nesters and holding territories. Not all territories are built the same. And the thing that we did not do in this project was actually look at metrics of um, say survivorship or fitness. So anything that we measured didn't correlate to if chicks got off of the nest or if an individual survived to the next um, breeding season or something of those sorts. Um, again, tundra, I think that it's really important that to talk about the importance of time because while we found a negative association with tundra, previous work uh, had found a positive association with tundra. But folks who are conducting those studies were showing up earlier in the season when most everything, as you can see here, is covered in snow. And so selection has a lot to do with time, for example. And folks who have watched previous talks on rosy finches uh, know that foraging along a retreating snow edge also has to do with whether you're in the early season or late season condition. When an entire um, <clears throat> alpine meadow is exposed, for example, uh, the selection pressure is much different than when you might have a 50 by five meter open patch to forage on and nesting season is just a few weeks away. Heat load index, uh, we didn't find any selection at uh, the site level with black rosy finches nor American pipits, a very positive association with white crowns. Uh, once again, I'm not surprised because a lot of their life history might be more dependent on uh, plant species that have a longer growing season. When it came to individual use, uh, black rosy finches did have a very negative abundance uh, or association with uh, locations of increasing, uh, say, heat load index, or I might switch back and forth with the word temperature, um, which we found pretty interesting as well. Uh, American pipits uh, also seem to have a negative association with warmer areas. And there was no statistical significance with regards to white crown sparrows. Woody vegetation. I, I think this is probably the most important uh, thing that we looked at throughout this project. Uh, it's interesting to know that they're associated with cliffs 
A lot of this we already knew a little bit from the natural history, but it was never quantified. But when looking at what really limits the abundance of black rosy finches and what really could cause a contraction in the future, I'm sure there's plenty of different things. And so while I talk about woody vegetation, uh, it's only one of the different components that is likely important, but it really does seem to define uh, where they breed. So with woody vegetation, uh, we found a negative association with increasing uh, vegetative land cover at the site level. So more willow, fewer finches. The same was true for American pipits, the other alpine obligate. And uh, keep on hitting forward, sorry about that. And with white crown sparrows, uh, a very positive association at the site or abundance level. When we look at individual use, uh, white crown sparrows have a really stark uh, association when it comes to probability of use and the distance from woody vegetation, as you can see. And that's not surprising to, I think, a lot of folks who've spent time uh, fishing in the Alpine, uh, where, say when we were doing our surveys, anytime we heard a white crown sparrow, it usually wasn't very hard to pinpoint where it was. You'd look for the nearest bush, listen for it to, vocalize again and usually it answered your question as to where it was on the landscape. Uh, with regards to black rosy finches, they're negatively associated. So not only do they not have high numbers at sites with kind of short encroaching willow communities or crumb holds, but individuals disassociate themselves spatially from that as well. You know, they, they stay further back. Uh, we don't understand why this happens to be Food competition may be an escape mechanism. Some species uh, will not seek refuge in a shrub. All others, if you spook them, will go directly into that shrub. Uh, none of this has been teased out. And with regards to American pipits, uh, they seem to have a slight positive association, but might, might not be biologically significant with, uh, uh, with uh, distances to woody vegetation. And some of this also might be that when an individual has a territory, uh, you know, there might be woody vegetation within that. And so they can never quite get away from it uh, on this alpine landscape. For those who don't believe in modeling, uh, out of all the thousands, oh, the one thing I want to say too is that when we look at our x axis, we only went out to locations with 30% woody vegetation cover. So if we went to sites with 100% woody vegetation cover, I would bet, would you know, bet my hat that we would find zero rosy finches. But then again, we were only looking at that narrow band of the x-axis. Like I said, for folks that don't like modeling, uh, only two out of you know thousands of observations do we actually see rosy finches in trees. This is a photo I took last fall uh, during the goat program in Grand Teton, and. Uh, uh, yeah, it was worth taking because we rarely ever actually see them in uh, structured vegetation like that. Okay, so a little bit of a recap using one of those Google Earth images when we just look at uh, individual bird locations. And I think a lot of it is self-evident. Uh, the pink dots are uh, black rosy finch locations. Green are white crowned sparrows. And as you can see, the finches are largely right next to cliffs while the white crown sparrows are next to, next to uh, structured woody vegetation and the American pipits seem to um, cover the two different uh, locations pretty well. So what are the implications long-term? I think that to do this, uh, it's really important to look at the Arctic. Uh, it's also another location where a lot of research has been going on uh, with regards to woody vegetation encroachment. And there's also a lot of the same species uh, that we find in alpine tundra. And there's, I think, one that illustrates it the most for me is that I think it's during a 24, oh, I don't have my notes in front of me, <clears throat> but I think during a 24 um, year period, there's a 75 mile advancement of white crown sparrows along the James Dalton Highway, uh, moving north through Alaska, kind of into that yellow bill uh, loon habitat which is pretty remarkable. So folks were doing roadside surveys and in uh, 24 years, they moved 75 miles north. 
and I, I would also bet that they were largely tracking that uh, willow expansion. There's a decent amount of literature out of the tundra, uh, Arctic tundra literature that talks about negative associations with tundra specialists and an outlook that would call for a contraction of these tundra obligates range. And also positive associations with species uh, like the white crown sparrow again. I think that the only species that you wouldn't find uh, throughout a combination of these uh, pieces of information are uh, rosy finches. But then again, uh, just a negative outlook for tundra obligates, positive outlook for uh, species of poleward moving uh, plant communities. So I think it's safe to say that the white crown sparrow, at least for a period of time, will probably be a winner in this, uh, in this process. American pipit here, as you can see, there's a nest underneath this rock. Uh, well, I'll tell you there's a nest underneath that rock and it's right next to uh, woody vegetation. However, despite these anecdotal findings, um, everything that we are looking at leads us to believe uh, the future is not great uh, in alpine environments for these obligates. Um, so a lot of folks, I think, start to begin to wonder what's the future and is there anything that can be done about it? Uh, I think often managers look at ways of modifying the habitat, the landscape, fire, whether it's intentional or uh, uh, not intentional. Uh, I think it's really, you know, it's a tool that's often used for bighorn sheep and opening up uh, woody vegetation across the landscape. I think one needs to be really careful though, because fire can, uh, often uh, wipe out, well, I'll put it this way. There's uh, Trevor Bloom, who's I'm sure has given a talk at uh, Bird Club or something similar, did his uh, graduate work on spotted saxifrag. And what they were looking at was whether or not after a fire, when say an alpine obligate or montane species is wiped out by fire, do they recolonize? And the answer is often no. Some folks in Europe often talk about the use of grazing sheep in the Alpine and keeping what they call sward height or say vegetation height down. Uh, I don't think this is uh, necessarily a great option because it won't necessarily combat the absolute movement of plant species, not to mention <laughs> the disease conflict from bighorn sheep and domestic sheep grazing would, um, it would be terrible to say quite the least and uh, uh, probably not a good option. When you look again at the Arctic literature, folks have used uh, reindeer in intentionally overgrazed areas that have high levels of woody vegetation to knock it down. Now, of course, you know, it'd be like crawling on your hands and knees in an area that moves or on a feed ground where the willows have been chewed down. It's not quite the same habitat at the bird eye level. But the big take home from some of these uh, grazing pressure uh, trials was that the, the tundra obligates never came back after they, they grazed down the woody vegetation. So we can't really shoot our way out of this one or it doesn't appear. The climate changes, um, you know, very slow moving bulldozer. I, I tend to think of it as that. So, you know, we think about places where there are small uh, shrub communities right now and what that might look like in the future. And one way of conceptualizing that is to go to places where um, woody vegetation has encroached over the last whatever period it happens to be. Say this is in the salts, I would never expect to see, this is near Stewart Peak, I would never expect to see a rosy finch. However, if somebody sees one, it's always good to be wrong. Places like Togedi Pass, where uh, you see a lot of uh, conifers that are uh, found near cliff faces might help folks conceptualize what uh, timber encroachment in these alpine areas might look like, because often in my mind, if I see a cliff, often I, I reject the idea that a tree could be there as well, until you look at places like the Bitterroots in Montana. So long-term projection is of course a loss of alpine habitats, and we would probably expect to see uh, species community turnover as well. And whether or not it's gonna impact the rosy finch more than the American pipit, probably just depends on location and nobody's uh, teased much of this information out. Um, I guess I'll get on a couple of kind of random points. I'd really like to thank uh, 
Mark Gokey, Jeff Fair, and Rona Donovan for uh, some of the popular literature pieces they've done on rosy finches. And if, you, if you're if you curious, you can look these up as well. I'm Killing for Rosies in Wyoming Wildlife in an Audubon piece uh, that Jeff Fair wrote, um, which I will say uh, might be important in the sense of uh, rosy finches have been largely understudied in the past. And there's now upwards of at least a half a dozen different groups looking at them where in, um, when I began and years prior, there'd be about one person per decade taking a look, except for early on in maybe the 50s and 60s. Um, for those who have been sitting here thinking about rosy finches and have said, aha, I have rosy finches at my bird feeder, I really would say go to the Sageland Collaborative website. I have the URL below, and uh, if anybody has information, they can contact me through the, I'm sure my email is on the uh, the bird club list, um, but there's now a central, you could say, repository of bird feeder results. And uh, this has to do with the fact that there, in the last couple of years, we now have an official rosy finch working group, uh, which is pretty exciting. So interest in alpine songbirds and finches has certainly gained traction. Um, and a little bit more of a plug for these guys. I split my time with Utah right now. They do great work, including Rosie Finch banding. Uh, uh, Janice Gardner on the right is uh, kind of the brains behind uh, the Rosie Finch working group at the moment. And uh, well, there's quite a few, uh, Tempe Regan and other folks who are in this uh, picture include Terry Pope from Utah DWR and Keeley Marble who works at Dugway. So, there is now quite an abundance compared to the past of rosy finch work going on. And in this project, uh, these birds actually have radio frequency identifier leg bands that then get picked up at bird feeders so they can track winter movements, survivorship. So a lot of good stuff to look at well beyond Wyoming. Uh, and I really have to thank Susan Patla as well. Uh, I am surprised we ever got money because it's really hard. Uh, there's a lot of good projects and not enough funding to go around. Uh, this project would not have seen completion without help from folks like Noah Bosworth, who stuck through the first field season, and pilot seasons are always quite difficult. Uh, Alex Rochette and Carl Underwood in 2017. Uh, and these guys, I think, would effectively walk the distance from Laramie to Jackson along the road through the mountains. And then once you get to Jackson, the way of thinking about it is they would run a bird survey all the way from Jackson all the way to the south gate of Yellowstone. So a lot of miles uh, these folks put in to get the results we have today. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank the University of Wyoming and all the staff at the co-op unit who really keep the lights on and the place running. Uh, Sophie Joe Miller, Amanda Larson, Carol Pribble, Kimmy Plum, and my committee members, and plenty more I uh, will never get to. But with that, um, I'll take any questions. Carl, thank you. Thank you very much. This is great stuff. Um, so I think what we'll do, Carl, is stop sharing. And uh, that way I can see who wants to ask a question. And I think what you're going to have to do is uh, speak up. And Chuck Harris says, thank you all. And a special thanks to Carl for the lovely Alpine photos. Try to make it, if you fall asleep, you can jump back in and at least enjoy the picture, so. <laughs> so anybody got any questions? I have to check here and see who's. How much of your survey was done by ear? Uh, a huge portion. Uh, well, a lot of the bird observations that we recorded visually began as auditory observations and then ended with finding the bird, but we definitely had locations, um, say a white crane sparrow and a shrub where it would never come out for us to actually see, but lone shrub, all the sounds coming from it, we made the assumption, so. So Carl, I've, you know, got a, just a, not a real technical question, but you had to put your face to the wall for a lot of this. Um, and I think I remember you telling me that 
you had to be out there at dawn or before because the birds only sang for like 30 minutes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, it, once again, really have to say thank you to the technicians that worked on the project because um, bird surveys, we would try to have, uh, I might not get it right, I think we had them at sunrise or maybe it was half an hour beforehand uh, because most rosy finch behavior is prior to 11 a.m. And to try to get consistent results, we would try to show up there early. And the other issue as well is that um, and somehow the first season, field season, we lucked out. One, nobody got hurt and everyone was largely working by themselves every single day, short of regrouping to go and then split off again and then regroup. Um, uh, but as folks know that by the time you hit noon, often you get a, an electrical storm. So folks had to be down from higher locations and uh, regroup and make sure everybody was okay to advance to the next location and split and then, um, so yeah, a lot of early season mornings, but the other problem too is often if it's really cold, you're not gonna pay any attention. Right. And your notes are terrible and your hands are shaking and you just don't wanna be there. So um, uh, yeah, but um, a lot of early mornings, but you know, thanks to all the technicians, they, you know, we might start at two in the morning and uh, they were good for it. This is not a walk in the park, in other words. Well, not always, only when we were doing team time. But it was it was cool. A lot of a lot of really neat stuff to see, to say the least. So, uh, any awesome. indications that nest sites are reused over time? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's a really good point. I think that when it comes to long term monitoring protocols, monitoring nest sites is probably it could be one of the best tools. So, some folks in Colorado have sites that have been used for decades. Um, I think the best that we have in Wyoming right now is uh, in the Beartooth, a site that um, I think with maybe one year missing in there, I've gone to for almost the last decade. Not only will they reuse the same uh, general cliff feature, uh, but they will use the exact same uh, nest cup. Uh, one thing for looking for nests is early season. Uh, well, I would say that if it's uh, mid-July or something like that, and birds are starting to fledge. When you look at a lot of these cliff faces, they're pretty snow-free. There might you know, uh, be a cornice above it, depending on the snowpack that you're uh, in the weather. But you, you look at it, you think, man, there's, there's so much real estate. What's really constricting where they breed? But when you get there really early, the whole face might be locked up in snow, and there's only a couple options. And uh, you'll notice that they will not use areas that are covered in snow that they can't get to them, and they might switch. And if you rappel down through there and check out all the sites you, you know of, um, you'll see different previous year's activity or when you're looking for nests, sometimes you'll see a lot of soil and vegetation. I wanna say I found, saw like a fern or something quite remarkable coming out of a nest where you knew without even getting there that it was a previous year's nest where due to nest building, soil had built up in that crack and um, there was no, you know, other natural process for that to take place that I would think of, but uh, yeah. I've got two questions here in chat. Um, Jeff says, can you speak to migration patterns for the three species you focused on? Okay, yep. So I specifically only looked at black rosy finches, but folks are um, looking at, say in Utah specifically, and I think Folks in Albuquerque, um, there's far too many people to mention that I'll remember, especially talking right now, but folks have been taking uh, toe clippings and looking at feather samples and trying to compare stable isotopes of where they might be molting or where um, they're growing different parts of their body. And then trying to look at, could you predict where their summer and winter range? I think that it's not entirely clear right now. Folks on the brown cap speculate that they kind of just go down slope around Colorado. We know that um, I can think of, I've gotten to go out and do banding with folks in Utah this year. You'll have, you'll have a bird in hand that you know is from Alaska based off of uh, some of his plumage, you know, as opposed to say in Jackson, very few black rosy finches will be seen at feeders until you get into March or April. And because I think it's safe to say most of our birds might go south. We could have that totally wrong. Maybe they're going east, no clue. But they probably go south into places like Utah 
in Albuquerque, or at least those are the stories we're telling ourselves right now. That's, and uh, Chuck Harris is asking, uh, how are food sources being affected by global warming? Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good question. Um, maybe when we're done with questions, I'll I have a slide that I can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, you want to put it back up? Yeah. Uh, if my if I could add in, what are the food sources? Yeah. So uh, for a black rosy finch, um, they're mainly we think of them as a granivorous. Uh, um, Huh, my PowerPoint, okay, it's still running. There we go. Yeah, we got it. All right, good. All right, something weird happened there. Uh, so rosy finches mainly feed on seeds and plant matter, we believe. I think one of the problems of looking at stable isotopes is you can look at, if I ate one red m and m and then I ate 50 blue ones, it could tell me I eat red and blue ones, but it can't tell me necessarily the amount. And folks who are on the bleeding edge of that can speak more to what quantitative analyses are now available, but <clears throat> I generally think of them as a, uh, a an omni, well, a, a generalist in the Alpine. And uh, I think from observations, we tend to see them, and this might get into um, what habitat resources are threatened. So yes, willows are moving in. There happens to be a nice piece of woody vegetation in the middle of this shot. But when you look at snow edge during that early part of the year, when they're showing up and they're trying to forage, um, often you see them on cliff faces because they're not just a big piece of stone, of course, they're a bunch of hanging terrace gardens. You know, when you get down to the bird level, the flowers are blooming earlier. Uh, you know, insects are more abundant, most likely. I haven't gone out there and measured it, but also the retreating snow edge where you have uh, different moisture levels, different insect abundance. You have seeds that are potentially so soft to eat, but they haven't put down a root yet or, you know, whatever stage that is you know, nutritious to them, uh, we tend to see them foraging at the edge. Here's a video. Can you see my cursor circling? Yep. Okay. Yep, we can. So that's black rosy finch in the middle, adult male. And as you can see, it likes, well, and this, it's foraging right at that uh, cusp of the retreating snow pack. There's all sorts of great ideas and I'm sure there's more than one. You can see in the upper right hand corner, Pippet, there you go. Oh, yeah. It's tail holding its territory. But uh, during that early season, we tend to think of them foraging on seeds and insects at that uh, edge. And then later in the season before, I had a picture of them feeding on a, a buttercup, a potentilla. Um, and uh, potentilla are, from what I can tell, uh, seem to be a big food resource, at least in Wyoming. Mm. Uh, but until they go to flower and then seed, different food resource availability are, um, you know, we're not entirely certain what they use at different points. Um, folks out of Santa Cruz right now, I think are trying to look at that and also um, Washington. So we'll have to wait uh, to see what their findings are using stable isotopes and summer trapping. Um, but their projects uh, started, I think, in, I'm gonna get it wrong, but I think 18 or 19 or 19 or 20, maybe before then. So um, maybe some exciting stuff coming down the pipe. Um, this is a slide from a, an older presentation where if we look at early, uh, ignore where it says nesting period, but just think of early season when there's a lot of snow. Uh, I haven't gotten around to make a figure that actually looks at, say, selection, but um, the two bars in the middle basically show, okay, where you have this zero mark, I haven't explained this one in a while, that is where snow and tundra meet. The majority of our observations are found either on snow, on tundra, but right at that retreating snow line. And the way I think about this is, you know, as a, the season goes on, now you have middle nesting period, ignore the nesting part, um, but the middle part of the season, uh, they transition away from that snow edge, uh, at least off of raw frequency observations to more of the center of the, the tundra and a lot of this is selection, but a lot of it also is driven by the fact that now you have a lot more open expanses. Uh, but by late season, uh, uh, once again, we're not looking at selection here. Uh, you see most rosy finches actually foraging in the middle of these uh, tundra patches. They're hitting all the seed. They're eating flower petals sometimes, or maybe it looks like they're eating flower petals because there's a seed in the middle. 
you know, was <laughs> just storytelling. Um, but I think that with climate change and folks and and folks have seen this in the the natural history literature and. This is something that John Stanek found in brown caps, um, and we replicated just to see if we could maybe gut check our data and also to see if we saw something similar in blacks, and it appears true. Uh, the way I think about this with regards to climate change is, if, if this snowfield right here, I'm going to make something up, but let's say it takes a month to retreat to a certain level, um, and if it does it in a week, uh, it might the, the availability of food resources might be impacted. Say, rosy finches might forage at the snow edge because they know that the seeds that they're seeing today were just revealed. Maybe it's information that nobody's uh, foraged there yet. They have uh, increased uh, resource. Um, uh, they have, a, I can't think of the term right now, but they have improved uh, mechanism for seeking out food. But if it all melts out tomorrow, it might be similar to if you have a, a refrigerator where you can fully pull your food out of for an entire week versus I unplug it on you and you have one day to make do. So all the same amount of food, but it's spoiling or it's uh, there's uh, a mismatch in the timing of resources. Late season availability of water appears really important, or I think folks have documented in patterns. Nobody's really gotten at it in finches. I think a lot of methodology I've used and other folks it's really hard to get results out of rosy finches to the old territories. It's really kind of messy. But um, the other one, uh, it's a little more of a, say, kind of controversial is uh, in on well, the Sierras, uh, folks notice that black or uh, gray crowned rosy finches, one of the three currently identified species, really uh, seem to hang out next to alpine lakes during the mayfly hatch. And you'll find something like several fold more rosy finches next to a lake that has stocked trout versus one that it, they were removed. They were naturally fishless. And then when you look at the behavior of the individuals, um, the ma overwhelming majority of the time, a rosy finch is at a lake, I should say a gray crown rosy finch is at a lake where there are no fish in it. Uh, they're foraging on these big mayfly hatches. And when they are stocked with trout, uh, you will see very little actually foraging behavior, a lot of, you know, loafing on shore. Nobody knows how this translates across different locations. Every single alpine environment is different. They're food generalists, um, but one part of their diet, and for, I think, all passerines, if I'm to generalize, is that for the first couple of weeks of, of life after hatching an individual, even if they're to eat a purely grain diet for the rest of their life, often they're feeding or they're uh, being reared on insects. Right. So are the gray crowns timing or hatch, um, you know, or, or things have fallen into place where it looks like they're timing it with a mayfly hatch, maybe. Um, does, does this actually drive abundance? I don't know, maybe not, but you know, it is, you know, it is uh, interesting to see that every little piece we tinker with uh, could have an impact. So I think that, um, uh, yeah, resource availability and what's there and the timing uh, could be largely impacted in the future by climate change, but no one has any definitive answers past speculation right now. Carl, I've got a, I've got a question, which is, you know, would be an anecdotal answer. Um, do you have any sense of what the typical clutch size might be? Yeah. And, and what survivability might be? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> clutch size uh three to six or three to five um typically about four okay. uh but very few nests have actually been found i think that um i think before this project there are so many nest observations that folks have seen that they haven't written down so it's not that folks have not seen them but documented in the literature for long-term access uh say in unfortunately re recently passed uh dick johnson uh, there might be good notes about locations of nests, uh, but I think that only a, a couple dozen have actually been right. uh, reached at this point. So small numbers, but I think, yeah, four, five. Got one last question here. Uh, any noted predators and if their possible change in habitat affects survival? 
Yeah, so in other words, predator survival in a changing habitat. Um, or who the predators are anyway. Yeah, so the predators uh, that folks have uh, observed, there's been a couple instances. I know that Tempe Regan, who uh, is a, their, their equivalent of a non-game biologist for Idaho Fish and Game. She's seen Clark's nutcrackers come in and harass them. Uh, Norman French saw them, I think, raiding a nest in the Tetons or maybe Utah. But very few. I mean, we're talking about like a very few observations and I wouldn't begin to put any weight on if they're driving anything. I, I don't think about predators uh, when I think about rosy finches, uh, but uh, I could be entirely wrong. But when I think it, uh, but with uh, gray crowns and, um, oh, here we go. I'll uh, share my screen again. Okay, so, well, that's a pipit nest, but here's a ground nest of a black rosy finch in the Wyoming range, right near, kind of near Coffin Peak. So it's on the ground and we found this one the last day of May, which is really early for nesting. Uh, when we came back in subsequent visits, unfortunately it looked like rockfall had wiped out the nest. Um, but at least in the gray crown rosy finches, a guy named Twinning, like the 20s or 30s skied into the Sierras and just sat there and watched them. And uh, he saw a couple nest sites that, what is a ground nest? Like, if you look at my cursor, you'd have a hard time maybe getting up on some of these cliff looking features, but they kind of look like ground, they kind of look like cliff. So there's a good in between area. And I think within those uh, folks will sometimes see uh, small mammal depredation events. But uh, I think of some of the work out of the Chalfoon lab on sagebrush obligates and how Deer mice are really doing a number on them, and nobody, you know, it's like, oh, it's coyotes, or it's got to be a badger or a raven, right? You know, it's, you know, it's, it's a thing that eats all the crumbs on your floor, you know. So, well, Carl, thanks very much. I'm, I'm so happy that you were available to do this. Thanks you know, for having me. You know, the 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 work that you're doing is, it's really important, but it's also, you know, it kind of harkens back to the day of adventure naturalists and uh i think we we've, we've got a few of them around here and people who are willing to go out and take some risks to get the data and i, I, I really it's a good excuse to go it. climbing at first but <laughs> you're working on me don't get to climb anymore because you just walk <laughs> up to the cliff and then you go home so yeah well i know there's more than a couple of people on this on this zoom who really wish they could be out there with you if we were 40 years younger. <laughs> Thanks so much, Carl, and we'll see you around. Right. Hope to see everybody next month, second Tuesday of the month, and uh, you'll, you'll get an email with the details. And thank you all for joining us. It was a great group tonight. Take care, Carl, see you around. <laughs>